And can I thank all the senators for their remarks and I share your condemnation of the civilian deaths over the past week, in particular child casualties. You've raised several, point, several points that I'd like to address, but first let me say uh, that it is clear that over two million people living in the Gaza Strip cannot endure another war. They've suffered far too much for too long already. The years of illegal blockade have resulted in extreme hardship, including poverty and food insecurity. Repeated cycles of violence and now the COVID-19 pandemic have further eroded coping mechanisms, leading to a mental health crisis, which particularly impacts actually on women and children. Civilians in Gaza, as I said earlier, simply have nowhere to flee. They are a population under siege, not just now, in the midst of this cycle of violence, but constantly for a long period. I would like to address some of the points raised regarding the civilian impacts on the Gaza Strip, where this latest es escalation risks worsening an already poor humanitarian situation. Israel, as an occupying power, is duty-bound to ensure unimpeded access to humanitarian assistance. Humanitarian access into the Gaza Strip must be ensured, especially through Erez and Kerem Shalom crossings. The United Nations and humanitarian partners must be permitted to bring in vital food, fuel and medical supplies and to deploy humanitarian personnel. Israeli airstrikes in the Gaza Strip may be targeted at terrorists, but the damage to homes, schools, hospitals and basic facilities for the people of Gaza is undeniable and cannot be ignored. I'm very concerned at UNRWA buildings that have been damaged uh, during the military operations in Gaza. UNRWA plays a vital humanitarian role in Gaza and needs to be protected and never targeted. According to the UN, 41 educational facilities in Gaza have been damaged, 36 of which are schools. There are over half a million school-aged children affected in Gaza by the conflict, half of whom attend UNRWA schools. The damage to UNRWA school buildings is deeply concerning. I've seen for myself in visits to Gaza the importance that families attach to their children's education. I've spoken to many pupils in these schools and heard their stories in English, given the quality of education that's there. Every child has a right to, to education, but in Gaza school means so much more to these children. It is their chance to escape the grim realities of their daily existence, a chance for them to shape their future and dream of an escape from the desperate cycle that they live in. At the moment, these schools are also providing shelter for over 40,000 internally displaced persons. They must be protected in line with obligations under international law and no threat to an UNRWA facility or an UNRWA school is acceptable. I would like to pay particular tribute to the dedicated staff of UNRWA and other UN agencies, ICRC, Red Crescent and NGOs who continue to provide critical services and support even in the most harrowing of circumstances. While much of the focus today is rightly on the violence and tension we are seeing in Gaza and the West Bank and of course in Israel too, we cannot and must not shy away from the enabling factors in all of this, which is in Israel's continued strategy of expanding settlements and the discriminatory practices by Israeli authorities against Palestinians. And that is not an anti-Israeli statement. It is a statement that is expressing concern and criticism of Israeli government policy, which is a different thing. Ireland has consistently and strongly opposed settlements and will continue to do so. I am very clear on the illegality of Israel's settlement policy, which can only be seen as a strategy to take possession of Palestinian lands. It is fundamentally undermining a two-state solution with every month that passes and a future viable Palestinian state. Actions such as the construction and expansion of settlements and the unnecessary destruction of Palestinian property are unlawful 
under international humanitarian law. Repressive, discriminatory and provocative policies and actions take us further away than ever from the prospect of achieving a just, lasting and comprehensive peace through negotiation and equality of esteem which is necessary to achieve the agreement that we seek. It's hard to deny that what we see on the ground, in particular the impact of settlement policy, is tantamount to de facto annexation. Elsewhere, the position is equally worrying. There is no real prospect of political talks resuming any time soon. And let's not cut ourselves. An absence that undermines faith in political action as a way forward. The postponement of Palestinian elections adds to this, and I'm particularly concerned that an entire generation of Palestinians has not yet had a chance to exercise their democratic rights. These frustrations are evident in the unrest across, across the, West, the West Bank in recent days. I've raised these issues in my contacts with the Israeli government and with Palestinian leadership. I will be speaking to my EU counterparts tomorrow at an emergency foreign affairs council and pushing for an EU response of substance. I hear your calls for action and let me assure you I have been assiduous in my efforts over the past week and I will continue to support all efforts to reach a ceasefire in response to the current hostilities but also to encourage a reinvigorated engagement by the international community to restart political engagement and a process of peaceful resolution. We cannot return to business as usual after this. And I think that is a fear that so many of you have outlined this evening. That is simply no longer a credible political option. We cannot return to the flouting of international law with the expansion of illegal, settlement, illegal settlements into occupied Palestinian territory, making a two-state solution a more and more remote possibility. We cannot, return, we cannot see a return to forced evictions of Palestinians from their homes in East Jerusalem and other parts of the West Bank. And we cannot return to demolition of Palestinian prop property, settler violence and or intimidation. We must acknowledge that these actions occurring at an unacceptable rate for many years are a source of legitimate grievance among the Palestinian people and undermine prospects for peace and reconciliation. I think it was Senator McDool talked about the consequences in a post-conflict situation uh, of the emotion and the hatred that is generated by the loss of life and injury is something that makes peacemaking so much more difficult and so much more painful. So the violence must stop. The indiscriminate targeting of civilians must stop. Rockets must stop. Progress requires dialogue and ultimately there can be no substitute for direct negotiations between the two parties. It is time to look afresh at how we can assist Israelis and Palestinians to bring new momentum to resolving this conflict. But I don't think anybody is overly optimistic at this stage. So let me conclude by firmly stating my commitment to a just and lasting peace in the Middle East. Uh, I know that I have been asked to, uh, to consider introducing the Occupied Territories Bill again. I, I spoke to, um, to Senator Black uh, last night. It was a, a conversation we've had before, but I think it was slightly more emotive last night given what we're seeing on our television screens and certainly from my perspective, the reports that I'm getting from our team in Ramallah uh, and Tel Aviv. Um, but my focus is on trying to make things happen on an international stage that can put pressure on uh, to move from violence into a cycle of negotiation. And I will use all the tools that I think um, uh, I can legally and credibly use to do that. Uh, I think uh, the frustrations um, with the lack of progress for the Occupied Territories Bill, uh, I understand. Uh, but I have to be honest too, uh, I have two Attorney Generals that have given me very clear advice in terms of what is EU competence and what is not. Uh, and I don't believe we can pr progress this bill in a legally sound way, I have to be honest. There are many other things we can do though, uh, and I look forward to working with Senators on those. Thank you.